I'm seeing the word recession appearing in my social media timelines and it's come up in conversations I've had with my coaching clients recently. And recession is a real fear, but the fear can also have a toll on our brains, a real cost. And it can put us in what some people call a scarcity mindset. And that scarcity mindset can actually impair our decision making, which leads us to make choices that actually do lead us into scarcity, which uh, becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy. So what can you actually do about that? So I spoke with my friend Al McBride about this. And when I realized the value of the conversation that we were having, uh, I, I interrupted him and asked if we could hit record and, and then just kind of restarted the conversation a little bit. So this is our unfiltered live conversation as we recorded it, as we talk about the topic of scarcity mindset and practical steps in dealing with it. So um, this is a unfiltered uh, raw take on just some things about scarcity mindset and what you can actually do, what changes you can make in your business that may be able to help with that. I was talking to a coaching client this week and he used the term like, I feel like I'm drowning um, when he was describing this. And so, and, and that can, you know, that can mean a lot of different things, but for, so just in this context, we're talking about um, the scarcity mindset when people have fears of recession uh, you you have maybe you've uh, clients who uh, say no to projects when you thought they were going to go ahead with them. So um, and and one thing that I know about this scarcity mindset, we talked a little bit about this earlier, um, off off tape. But one thing I know about the scarcity mindset is when you are in that mindset, it actually forces you to make bad decisions. There's a book called Scarcity, which talks about this. But you actually make bad decisions and poor choices because of that mindset. Um, and that's why it's particularly dangerous. Yeah, it's so, because, as we were saying, you're in much more of survival mode. Yeah. And now you can do the extreme, more extreme version of survival mode we are talking about, fight or flight. But either which way, the, what's typical of that is that people are quite tonal visioned. Mm -hmm. so, well, think of it literally for survival. You don't need to see every option. You need to see exit sign or what you know salvation that you run toward or fight toward uh, and that's it so it was helpful in that context it's not helpful in a, in a lot of ways in a modern business context you know where you're not really thinking through the problem you're just acting often with a very short term ism mm -hmm. uh, it's also the it was interesting that when you were explaining there you came in i felt almost in the middle uh, that you were talking, and, you, and you're right, I get it, you were teeing it up, but it's one of those interesting things that you were saying, uh, scarcity mindset, but it's where does that come from? It's, it, as you said, it's from clients where suddenly there was there was opportunity a couple of months ago, or as if people were interested, and then it's like, oh, we can't do that because our budgets are slashed. Oh, we have no budget for that. And you're hearing this and hearing this and hearing this. And so it, it's that classic thing uh, that, uh, because of fears of a recession, specifically. Exactly, because of fears of a recession. But this is the point is that people talk themselves into a recession. And then it's a chain reaction of people. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I'm not talking myself into a recession, but they're telling me there's a recession because of the way they're acting. Mm -hmm. So then you have to adapt. But uh, as a business advisor, a friend of a friend said to me many years ago when I was an art dealer, when the recession 2008 hit and i was basically shutting up shop essentially because the first thing to go is you know buying art for businesses uh and they said to me okay that makes sense i can see why but he, he kind of wouldn't let me away with the simple explanation that the economy has killed it and i like that i think i even liked it at the time but he said somebody in your industry is making a killing right now who is it and I said, oh, well, off the top of my head, it's probably the auction houses because the people who need to get in cash quickly to pay debts are bringing their pictures, their, their artwork when they bought in better times. <laughs> and people with some cash who want to clean up when it's, you know, 40% off the regular price, essentially yeah. are going in and getting the bargain. And that's what happens. That's the same as the stock market. People are selling who are, who are, who are in fear and people with cash are... As somebody, I think it was Tony Robbins, or whatever, was talking about this, where he says, 
it's the only time when it's like going into a Ferrari dealership and seeing 70% off and people going, oh my God, this is terrible. <laughs> like if you have cash, it's amazing, right? But that's the point. It's the mm -hmm. perspective shift. So what I, and this is not the easy part. This is the difficult part is, as you said, either you sell something to the same group of people that is a no brainer for them to buy that isn't a luxury item, right? So for example, one of the services I did before I shut up the art game was actually uh, various art evaluation for their insurance and there was other stuff about moving their art around and just different services instead of buying more art, right? And that's a poor example, but the point is you, what does that same client need that you're currently not providing or aren't aware, they're not aware that you can provide? So that's one way, but the other one is, you know, what can you pivot to? And that that's the, the other the flip side of that is what can you pivot to that they do need? Yeah. So I, I there's a nice pithy kind of phrase, which is um you either need to change the people or you need to change the people. And and so exactly. uh, in, in that case, that means um either change your client's mindset or 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 you know the 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 way that you position what you're uh, selling to them, or go find different clients who who aren't in that scenario. And so you're changing what your offering is or the way that you're pitching it to them and explaining it to them in a different way. Right. Maybe I mean, that's doing things like offering money back guarantees and things like that. Absolutely. Because you have to make it a no brainer. I mean, with every trans, every deal, every agreement, there's an element where one side is taking on more risk than the other. And when people are in fear zone, they're extremely risk averse. They're high mm -hmm. per conservative in their decision making, as you say. And so if you're consulting into that and they're saying, we've no budget, especially for consultants as if they're a luxury, mm -hmm. then you say, well, I'll tell you what, if I save four times my fee, does that sound good to you? If I'm here mm -hmm. to save you four times the fee that you'll pay me, does that sound reasonable? Because then you're, you're flipping it on them. It's like, you'd be mad not to, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? But, but it's a totally different offer. It's a totally different proposition. Yeah. Now, now the counter to that, somebody might say, well, you know, th they may not believe that. And, and that's where you say, well, I'll, I'll guarantee it. I can bring in a guarantee. I'll give you a straight yeah, exactly. guarantee if I don't achieve that. Well, if they don't fee. believe it, then that, that's another problem. But you, you have to make yeah. it, as you said, ambitious, but believable. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And you can even ask them then, well, what would you believe? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I believe I you, issue... you know, you'll make me twice your fee. Okay, fine. That's, that's perfectly fine by me. <laughs> uh, look, we're, we're being a little bit flippant here, but because it is tough, it is tough when you're in that zone. I think we've all uh, spent time in that place yeah. at one but, stage. But the, the, the issue for me is um, that what's happening is people are becoming more risk averse. But if you take zero risks, you make no forward movement. Like you have to take some risks. You won't save your way to success. You have no, to exactly. actually take... you, you can cut and slash costs and overheads only so much mm -hmm. i mean it's a good idea to you know tighten a few belts and you know be a bit oh, yeah. more lean like, that was one of the wrong with that, that. that i did a lot of back in uh early march of 2020 was uh, i re-examined every single recurring payment that i was making in the business mm. and i slashed a whole bunch of them and uh, I was actually pretty ruthless with, you know, there was even a couple of things where I was paying, you know, $10 a month here, $50 a year there. And I just cut them because I, I was, I was reducing every recurring ongoing payment that was mm. not absolutely necessary for the business. No, as I said, that's a good, a good idea, idea to, to do, do once a year or so anyway. Yeah. It's a good idea to do that, whether it's a recession or not. Exactly. But, um, but in this case we have people, um, you know, looking at cutting potentially essential, maybe not essential, but in very important services. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think you've got to balance that. You've, you've got to find. So if we're if if we as a service provider, as a consultant are trying to sell into an environment where our clients is in a scarcity mindset and, and we talked about like what that actually means, the scarcity mindset and that it can actually make you make incorrect decisions and, and the, the book scarcity goes into this in a lot of detail explore that just for a minute just let's scope that out mm -hmm. what type of i was gonna say inappropriate decisions they're they're 
they're not optimal decisions. They seem like obviously the right decision at the time. Otherwise you wouldn't be making them. They probably seem like the only option. And it sounds like the classic thing where when you have one option, you're giving yourself an ultimatum, as they say, when you've two, you have a dilemma. It's only when you've three that you actually have proper choice. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but that's a human issue. Like it's a human uh, thinking error is often we jump at, oh, that's the answer. Or even if whether we like it or not, or we go, it's either A or B. And it's usually a binary. We often fall into binary decisions, mm. decision making, which is, again, natural. I mean, the way I would do this with clients where the, they go, oh, it's either it's this is the answer or it's A or B. It's X or Y. It's black or white, uh, A or B. Uh, and that's so limiting. Just literally stopping and say, is there maybe one more possibility? Mm -hmm. Even if it's a combination of A and B to get C uh, or, or something completely much further out there. And then all of a sudden you have more options to play with. Oh, what if, Oh, how about, oh. and then suddenly the creativity is working. You can't be creative in survival mode. I think you just think can't. That, that's really important is, is being in that scarcity mindset is it's having a toll on your brain. Like it's, it's costing you mental energy huge yeah. and it, it's it's limiting your ability to um to weigh the pros and cons of decisions very much very much and i think that's the that's the thing that it's um because and and so that's the case if there's a perception of scarcity and, and scarcity is a scarcity of, of a resource of some kind and that could be money which is the major one uh, it could also be time as well but it's it's this this thing where our decision making is actually impaired because we're in that scrabbling kind of um almost like hyperventilation mentally you know mm -hmm. and and that's the thing that i find really interesting about it and trying to uh, trying to switch out of that like how do you switch out of that well not to get too down into the weeds but the first way is you actually take control of your breathing when you're getting nervous, when you're in fear state, your breathing goes very high, which creates a, a neurological loop that, oh, I'm in a fear state, we're ready for attack or being attacked. And you're in that state. So when you breathe deeper, A, you're literally filling your brain with more oxygen, better, but also that change in you taking control of something that's automatic most of the time also tells your brain, hey, we have more, we have more agency here than we thought. Or maybe things aren't as bad as we thought. And it's been shown neurologically that it opens up new areas of the brain again for getting, stepping out of that survival mode into literally what they call challenge mode, where you're suddenly seeing possibilities, you're able to strategize, you're able to work things out, you know? Uh, and that's kind of where you want your headspace to be, to start to look for, okay, I'm screwed. Well, am I? Well, how, what would it look like if I wasn't? What might be doing? Oh, okay. But what are the other possibilities? This is what they said. Well, what's the underlying need there for, of the client or, or of the market? And either you can keep, you can tweak things to sell to the same market. What do they need now? Or you can say, well, who else might need the thing that I have now? Right. So maybe you go to a different market where your offering has a, a better as so say, product what you're talking fit. about there by the way it's, it's very logical so so you're talking about a, a very logical response to figuring out what the answer might be you know in in terms of dealing with the problem that you're facing but but what you said previously as well is okay before you even get into that logical state first deal with the physical impact of taking literally taking a breath yeah yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah which yeah. is fascinating um absolutely uh, and so, okay, so so on a very practical level, we're talking about, first of all, taking that breath and making sure that, you know, you're physically able to think. It's literally breathe 15 to 30 deep, slow breaths. Mm. If you're sitting into the seat, if you can imagine, like right down deep in your belly. And there's loads of different breathing techniques. But the point is just start breathing deeply and being aware of your breathing. Right. And that starts to actually, you'll literally feel some people feel significantly different other people feel only mildly different but the point is it changes your physical state which helps to change your mental emotional state mm -hmm. they, they start to get a little nudge right yeah. and then that's where you can start that's what if 
Mm-hmm. And then you're starting to get what if is the da- is the start for creativity? So the engineer in me wants to turn this into a checklist. Okay, so, <laughs> cool. Because I, I like to make these into these like practical, easy to follow things, right? So the first thing we do is if we're if we think that we're in this scarcity mindset, this state is get our breathing and physical state just calm down. Well, if you really want to start, you can do what they call thought stopping, where you notice your because often you, you're hearing a lot of oh god, uh, whoa, 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 panic talk, or even if it's not panic, it's just very negative talk in your mm-hmm. head. Yeah. And just saying, stop, stop mm-hmm. the voice just rattling in your head. Yeah. And then you go inward, breathe, try and just concentrate on your breathing. And yeah, your mind will wander. That's okay. Bring it back. 15 to 30. In mm-hmm. out is one, right? Okay. Right. That's the, then you do say 30 breaths, right? Then what? <laughs> yeah. So, so thinking logic. So, first of all, like saying to yourself, hey, this, the the way that i'm thinking now uh my thinking may actually be impaired by this scenario and so um just be aware of that because just that awareness will will help uh, absolutely um, and and this and, is something you mentioned before there, just there is inter- this thing that's taking a toll on me uh, like mentally uh, and it like it's increasing my ongoing cognitive load so that I don't have as much space for making decisions. Usually, as I said, it's the survival mind ship. You're going into tunnel vision. You're not seeing other options that may be there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're also then falling into one of the biggest psychological biases is confirmation bias, i.e. you one looks to confirm what we believe to be the case. And we automatically omit or almost make invisible counter evidence or evidence to the contrary. Uh, so what we're trying to do is is get out of that confirmation bias. So if you think, oh, there's a recession coming, there's a recession coming, there's a recession coming, because that's what people are telling you. That's N equals the six clients who told you that. Now, that, that might be most of your world. And maybe you're reading about it and you're going, oh, my God, and you're getting into panic. We have to also realize it said that you are, you are now contributing to the recession happening faster. You are a contributor. It's like, you know, oh, I better take my money out of the bank because I hear it's dodgy. But taking your money out accelerates it defaulting, right? So it, you're part of that. So also realize that your filter is now there's a recession happening. Oh, God, oh, God. So putting that aside, not saying that that's invalid and that society might be heading toward a recession. But then it's like, well, how do you make money in a recession? How do you, in your industry, potentially with your skill set, make money in recession? Right. And this is like the <laughs> next step in this checklist is logically thinking and and examining all of the options, even the ones outside of the tunnel vision that you might currently be in. Be in. Exactly. And so be aware that you might have that tunnel vision and that there is stuff outside of what you're looking at. So as we said, the first two levels that are most obvious are literally saying, with my current group of clients or past clients and people like them who tell me they have no budget, who tell me this, how can I change my offering, whether it's the wording or the actual service mm. that you provide, one or the other, to fit their needs so it's a no-brainer? Mm. The other option, just again, just this is the first two that spring to mind, there may be many more, is how do I sell my current offering, maybe even with different packaging, different wording, to a different group of people who aren't in maybe your current client sets mindset just yet, Mm -hmm. right? So, like we just to say, we saw this in COVID times all Mm -hmm. over the shop, particularly with restaurants. Service industry was decimated, right? And you had, I noticed in the restaurants around me, you had some of them going, oh, we're closed and we're closing down and it's all doom and gloom. Others hustled. They immediately went into hustle zone. They They were closed like a day and they already had... You know, COVID pickup, order over the phone, the website's on the way next week and all this sort of stuff. They were amazing. They just managed to adapt so fast. I mean, so brave. Like, I'm, none of this was easy, you know, either way. But some restaurants, by example, managed to adapt. They were trying, experiment with this, experiment with that. That didn't work. Oh, that was a mess for... Uh, we needed better stuff than the things they got to transport the food. So they made that better. But it was an iterative process. It was an adaptive process where those others sort of saw panic. Oh, we can't possibly do that or 
for whatever reason, that won't work for us. And then they ended up shutting down, which is a shame. But, you know, it, it speaks to two very different points of view. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like that classic one where you have these twin brothers. And one was this in and out of prison, you know, drug user, all of this. Oh, well, I was bound to, you know, grow up like this because I'm part of the system and I had this horrible childhood and all this. And that was totally valid. He did have a horrible childhood, right? Mm -hmm. But that was the story. The other brother is multimillionaire who goes, well, I had to hustle for everything I got, but I'm always looking for opportunities. There's always money on the table somewhere. You just, and other people are too comfortable, but I had that edge because I never had that safety net. So that made me hungry to find the opportunity every time. Blah, blah, blah. So the same situation, radically different perspectives. Mm. Yeah. And again, and I apologize because that's a very flippant uh, and, 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 and weak example. So I apologize that it's not typical in many ways. Mm -hmm. But it is an example of just the filters that we apply to our environment and how some people feel this negative inevitability and other people feel this much more constructive almost inevitability. It's like I'm the one who gets it over the line. Mm -hmm. That's some people's yeah. story. You know, other people's story is, oh, uh, the SH1T hits the fan and I get covered in it. That's the way it works. Yeah. The, the other thing is, um, in it, like, g going back to what you said about, you know, who's, who's making money, there's always somebody making money in, in any negative situation. Um, your competitors are also feeling the same pain, most mm. likely. And so if you can, if you can make the scenario work, if you can make it work for you in that scenario and your competitors don't, you could actually grow. So because you were able to figure it out. I mean, you because remember all those stats during the last recession about how, well, some of the greatest companies ever, most of the greatest companies, longest lasting ones were created mm -hmm. in the middle of the worst recessions. Yeah. Um, some practical stuff. Cause I, I, I like to keep it, keep it really practical sure. as well. Um, I, I wrote some notes, uh, for folks at the start of the COVID shutdown. You just reminded me of that, um, at a very high level. Um, the first thing is just to assess the situation and, uh, look at taking action straight away and what you need to act on. One thing that's important, I think is to call your clients. I think this is important all the time, hmm. but call your clients because they're uncertain right now as well. Just call them and talk to them and, and. Uh, maybe brainstorm some ideas with them or show them that you care. Mm. Um, brainstorm, brainstorm ideas with them, you know, without making it a sales call. Just, hey, exactly. what are some things that might help with the scenario that you're in? It, it's uh, also then, then, obviously, sorry, go ahead. I just point out a few things with that. First of all, I love it because you're, again, instead of being in, in survival mode where you're in reactance, you know, you're reacting. Mm -hmm. Instead, here you're acting with more agency. Yeah. What are my options? And then you're going to maybe your better self where you're actually, instead of being afraid of the call from your client in case they're going to cancel on you or something, you're actually doing the opposite. You're reaching to them mm -hmm. and saying, how are your needs changing so that you can adapt to those needs with them? But again, you're a partner rather than this sort of distant provider person who's cancelable. You're mm -hmm. less cancelable, you know, so you're getting ahead of that. Yeah. And helping them. How can I help you? better at this stage and mm. all of that just speaks to just it's just far better an approach yeah I, and i think it's it's kind of uh it's it's a it's a bit like going into the um the j abraham what's it called the theory of preeminence is that what he calls it mm -hmm. the concept of being um fiduciary what's the, what's the term that he uses it's a legal term fiduciary yeah like being a fiduciary and i know it has a legal meaning but it also just means putting your clients interest ahead of your own like financially and in every way and um, which is really what we should be doing if we're doing the best job properly for our clients is we, well, should, we should always have their, anyway. first, their yeah. best interests exactly. so uh, so i think it's got it's, it's kind of doubling down on that you know it is and also realizing that as you said for everyone around you uh, in your competition mm -hmm. how many are having are in survival mode or how many are adapting mm-hmm Right. Uh, and giving yourself credit that you're actually being proactive in improving your situation. And yeah, it mightn't be easy and there'll be some shakeup and, it, you know, things won't be maybe how they were last year. Uh, but also realizing, as I said, that you're doing something about it and you're connecting in with the clients to see what, what their heads are, how you can help that better and so on. Mm -hmm. um, 
all of this is is easier said than done. Yeah, you know? but but it can be done. Exactly, and and it it's it's a more positive thing thing to be thinking about than just being in a state where you're looking at your books and you you see that a client has cancelled and you see that there's potentially a recession looming and you're just in that state of fear so it's it's taking positive steps to improve the situation and and also i mean having those conversations like it, it almost never hurts to have a phone call with your clients in any scenario like it's a good thing to do but in this in this case you're you're showing that you're being proactive and that you um you really do want to help improve their condition which is an alan weiss phrase um mm. but that's that's our job is to improve our client's condition true 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 so al thank you for allowing me to record this because i think it was an interesting conversation and um if people are listening to this on my podcast or watching this on youtube where can they find more from you just go to almcbride.com a-l-m-c-b-r-i-d-e.com and cool. you'll see all you need about me or reach out to me on LinkedIn. And you have a podcast called Dealing with Goliath. A podcast called Dealing with Goliath. Check it out. Awesome. Thank you, Al.